I'm going to talk about the blessings of being in Christ. The blessings of being in Christ. Uh, Ephesians, the first chapter. I, I want to read just one verse to you from Ephesians, the first chapter. And uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, this uh, let's start at verse 3 just one verse praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms or heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ we are seated with Christ and having been seated with Christ the Bible says Paul the Apostle says we are blessed with many every spiritual blessing in Christ Blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Heavenly Father, I need you. I need the Holy Spirit to come now and speak very clearly to our hearts. Lord, quicken my body. Give me the strength needed to bring this. And I pray, Holy Spirit, the undergirding. Your undergirding in what I say and what I speak. Sanctify this vessel. Let the pureness of Christ come forth. Lord, not my purity, but the righteousness of Christ. Nothing of ourselves, but all of Jesus. Lord, lead us now into the majesty of your name, who you are and what you have done for us and what the Father intends for us in his Son. Lord Jesus, open our eyes and our understanding. Give me a greater understanding even as I preach it. Lord, bring me into this fullness. Bring this church into the fullness that is in Christ. Lord, we're going to magnify your name. We're going to magnify your name as we've never magnified it before. Because truly, you said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. I'll draw all men to myself, you said. Not to the church, but to you and to your heart. Reveal your heart to us. Lord, I feel the urging of the Holy Spirit, the hunger of the Holy Spirit, the readiness of the Holy Spirit, the desire of the Holy Spirit to take us deeper in Christ. Lord, if we think we have it all, if we've been here 15 years and heard so many sermons and think we have it all, Lord, we haven't even begun. We don't even begin to understand, and we pray for that understanding. Unlock our thoughts, unlock our minds. And Holy Spirit, come now. Come and glorify Christ as it is prophesied in your word. You would glorify, you would bring to our remembrance all the words that Jesus spoke. So come, Holy Spirit, capture this word and take it into our hearts. Let me see it in its glory. Let me see it in majesty so that I can relay it and open it to this people. Lord, that you would lead us beyond anything we've known. Lead us to places we've not seen in the heavens with you in a new realm. God, that it would increase the glory of Christ in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed by the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now that's a promise to every believer. Every spiritual blessing. Now folks, that is just a mere phrase, unless you know what those blessings are. What are the blessings we have been promised? The blessings that come from being in Christ, being seated with Christ in a heavenly place, knowing our position in Christ. And once you know that position, and once you claim that the Bible said you are recipient of every conceivable blessing that God has in his treasury, every spiritual blessing. Now, Ephesians was written to the faithful in Christ Jesus. These were people who were sure of their salvation. They knew who they were in, in Christ. Paul the Apostle <clears throat> taught them that they were seated with Christ in the heavenly place. They well grounded the truth about being made to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This was the absolute gospel of Paul the Apostle, that God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly place. They knew that they were chosen by God. These people were so well schooled in the doctrines of salvation, in the doctrines of the resurrection, the doctrines of the Holy Spirit, 
They could teach any person who was hungry for God. Probably everyone in the Ephesian congregation could be a teacher in Times Square Church or anywhere today in our, our, in our Christian society. They were, they were well trained in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope of eternal life. These people, those who knew that they were loved of God, they were faithful, Paul says. He's writing to the, the faithful ones in the Ephesian church. The Ephesians believed in rejoicing in the redemption through Christ's blood, Paul said. A very blessed people, knowing the riches of God in Christ Jesus. And they were truly a blessed people. They could glory in the cross. They could tell you all about the suffering of Christ. the shed blood, redemption, sanctification, justification. Every doctrine they could teach. But there was more. So much more. I trust that this church is an Ephesian type church. I trust that by now, if you've been coming for any period of time to this church, that you're well schooled in the basic doctrines Did you know about the blood of Jesus Christ and its redemptive power? You know the victory that comes by faith, not by works, but in the faith of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. These things should be well known to you. You should have been schooled in this now, in the teaching of our teachers and the pastors from this pulpit, and from your own Bible reading and your study and your walk with Christ. But I dare say the majority hearing me now have never entered into the joy of what God has promised. Have never really enjoyed their salvation. You can know all these doctrines. You can know about the sacrifice of Jesus. You can know about his, the power and cleansing grace of his blood. You can know about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can know about heaven and hell. You can know all these doctrines and still be miserable in your salvation. And still have never entered into the blessings that God ordained and desires for those who are in Christ. I I, I would dare to say the majority of Christians all over the world are living so far beneath their privileges. We have not even begun to understand. We talk about Jesus. We glory in his name and the cross. And yet many are miserable. Living from depression, high and low, never fully understanding the glory of the cross, the victory of the cross. And more than that, not just a crucified Savior, not just a resurrected Savior, but a man in glory. A man who is now in glory. A man who still has his manhood and still has his godness. He is God, yet he still has flesh. A God who's touched with the feeling, a Christ who's touched with the feelings, our infirmities, yes. But one who wants to bring us into the glory that he has. It's not a glory that's going to come. It's a glory he said he has given. He said, my father has glorified me and I have glorified you. There is a glory that awaits us that we have not yet entered into. And that's what my message is about this afternoon. A lot of forgiven people, a lot of baptized people are not living in the joy of the Lord and they're not living in true victory because they've never really tasted it. You say, that's not possible. I've walked with God for, you you can tell me you've walked with God 50 years. I've been preaching 50 years. So that's not a stretch. And it's possible. And I meet people who have been in in, in, in walking in the way of Christ for years And especially I've seen it in the early Pentecostal movement. I've seen many people my age, after 50 years of service to the Lord, die in misery, wondering if they're really saved, having known the doctrines, in fact, who boasted on having a revelation of the Holy Ghost like nobody else, and still die, never entering into the fullness there is in Christ. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples, Because I live, ye shall live also. And at that day ye shall know, you shall know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. God says, 
And in fact, we're living in that day that Jesus prophesied. He's talking about his cross and his resurrection and ascension life. And he is saying, in that day, after I'm crucified and go to the Father, in that day, you shall know that I am in you and you are in me. Now, we know that as a truth. We know that as a fact. We do not know it in experience. We are now living in that day when we are to know our position and our place in Christ Jesus. Position simply means where you've been placed, where you are. God has placed us, who has made you to sit with Christ in heavenly places. This is the work of Jesus Christ. Our position, our place is in Christ with Christ in us. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm living in a heavenly place. I feel like I'm living in a wilderness. I am living in pain. I'm living in times and seasons of depression. I'm living in times of sorrow, discouragement. I am being harassed by the devil. Now, folks, that's common to all believers. At times and seasons of our Christian walk. But you see, these are those who have never really had the revelation. And I believe God is trying to bring us into this full revelation of what it means to have God by his Holy Spirit on your confession of faith and your willingness to surrender to the full will of God that he will place you not just factually, not just textually, but he will place you spiritually where you know that you know that you know that you are abiding in Christ and he's abiding in you and you are one with him. And you will begin to claim the blessings that come with that. And I guarantee you, you will never again in your life, though you sorrow, you will rejoice. Nobody will take the rejoicing out of your heart once you know. In Christ, in heavenly places, is what God says of me. It's not what I say. It's what God said. And God is not a liar. God's view. I, you can't have your view of, of what God thinks about you. You have to see it through God's eyes. When Jesus went to the cross, he made a declaration under covenant. And listen closely. God says, I will never recognize but one man. One man. I am finished with the cross finishes all flesh. No flesh can stand in my eye. I will accept nothing of flesh. None of your good works. None of all your striving. I can't accept it. You cannot stand before me. I not accept I accept one man. One manhood. That's Christ. Only one can be righteous. Only one has been holy. Only one is pure. Only one will sit with me at my right hand. Jesus was asked by two disciples, by the mother of, of, of two disciples, my request is you let one of my sons on the right and my other son on the left. The Lord said, it's, it's not mine to give it to the father who has it prepared. The Lord knew who it was. It was his own son. His own son was prepared to be seated at the right hand of the father. And as sure as he's accepted Christ, he's accepted me, he's accepted you. And the moment you have fully given your life to Jesus Christ, you've allowed the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in your life, and you become totally subject to the will of God and the moving and the walking and the breathing of the Holy Spirit in your heart. That is when you are made to sit with Christ and he receives you as dearly and as clearly as receives his own son. And you are as close to God as Christ is. Do you understand that? You are in the throne room. It's not like Esther now. You're not Esther who stands nervously waiting for the king to reach out the scepter to give her approval to approach the throne. No, my friends, you are at the throne in Christ. You are there by the king. You don't need a scepter. You've had the blood that opened the door. You are seated with Christ. I said you don't have 
You don't have to scream at me to wake me up. You have to bring me down from heaven. You don't have to bring me up from the ground. I am near you even at your mouth. He's right there. He's right here. Now, to be in Christ, you don't have to leave the earth. Forget this idea that you have to somehow uh, manufacture some feeling that I'm going to drift out in space and he's out in the ether somewhere. He's out in, he's in paradise. He's in the throne. Yes, but he's a spirit and not even the heavens can contain him. He is here and the Bible said, let, let, let me let the word speak for itself. If a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Now you know that this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. My, the father says, you love me and you obey me. He said, I'm going to come and your body, this temple of the Holy Ghost is going to become our abode. God Father, God Son, and God the Holy Ghost living and abiding in this temple. You don't have to go out someplace. The temple of the Holy Ghost is right here. God's presence. God's presence. He's not just in the atmosphere. We have that song we sing, I can feel him in the atmosphere. Yes, he's in the atmosphere. But he, this is his temple. This is where he abides. Yes, he is in glory. He's in paradise. But God's spirit fills the whole earth. And God's spirit it abides in me. He abides in you by faith. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. I will love him and will manifest myself unto him, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also will be one in us. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfect in one. Jesus said, Lord, you gave me your glory. Now, I give them the glory that you give to me. What is that glory? Now, I hope you heard what I just read. I read it again. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. We have been given the glory. Do you have the glory? It's not a shout. It's not a shake. It's not some kind of emotional feeling. It's a glory. Let me tell you what that glory is. Unimpeded access to the Father. An open door, access. The word access itself means the right to enter. The passage or a way to approach. And it also connotates ease of approach. Christ Jesus made it easy. He opened the door. He has access. Now, when Jesus walked this earth, the glory he's talking about was that immediate access of his heavenly Father to the point that he said, I don't do anything except what I hear and what I see of my heavenly Father. Now, Jesus didn't have to go off and, and pray for hours to try to get direction or a special endowment of something. He prayed intensely. He prayed often. But that was for fellowship. That was fellowship. But when he's ministering his daily walk, healing the sick, casting out demons, walking to this place and to that place. There was always that voice of the Father. There was always that intimacy. And folks, that's what I'm talking about. We pray for the fellowship. We seek God. We're, we're called in the Bible to be seekers after God, searchers after God's heart. But when you begin to realize the access that we've been given through the sacrifice of Jesus, that the same access that he had is given to us. We have the same degree of access to the Father as Christ had on earth. We have the same access to the Father that Jesus has now because we are seated with him in the throne room in Christ Jesus. Oh, I, you say this is mind-blowing. It's mind-boggling to think that we would have access to the Father at any time. That I don't, if, if I'm in a crisis, I don't have to run somewhere and pray and say, God, oh God, please help. God, where's your voice? Where's your direction? 
No, because there's a knowing, there's a voice behind me. There's a voice that this is the way, walk ye in it. And there's an all-knowing because the mind of Christ is given to us. And the Holy Spirit who abides in us is the Spirit of Christ himself. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. In all of our direction, and that that still small voice that said, this is the way. How he speaks his yes and his no. How he clearly directs when you say, this is my life. Yes, I live, but not I, but Christ now is living in me. And if he's living in me, everything that has to do with my life is included. <clears throat> every direction, every act, every deed. For through him, that is Christ, we both, means he's talking about those afar off, every generation from the time it was spoken. He said, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him or in him. Boldness and confidence to enter into his presence, boldness and confidence. By faith, we we come into this place of uninterrupted, unimpeded relationship with the Lord, access to him at any time. The truth about our union with Jesus Christ was a hidden mystery to the church until Paul the Apostle came on the scene. The church had never heard this gospel. What you're hearing now, the church of Jesus Christ had not heard. It was given to Paul by the Holy Spirit to unveil the mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ abiding in you. You say, well, we've heard that, but it had not been heard in the church of Jesus Christ until Paul came. And... Paul unveils the mystery as the Holy Ghost opened it to him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's speaking, I told you, a church who knows the saving grace, knows all the doctrines, have repented. They know what it's like to be embraced by the Heavenly Father. They know all of that. They've been walking for years with Christ. But Paul, Paul comes on the scene and he says repentance is not enough. He comes on the scene and he said, tears are not enough. He comes on the scene, he said, all of your good works and all things, that's not enough. All of your righteous labors, even that is not enough. Even all the knowledge that you have gained to this time is not enough. He said, there's more. There's much more. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Paul's saying, you talk about having received the Lord. We talk about that too. Yes, I've received Jesus as Lord. But have you received him in the fullness of what Paul is speaking about here? Have you if you received him now? Where where you say, I want the full revelation, I want to receive everything that he has for me. I don't want just the knowledge of my salvation. I don't want to know just about heaven. I want to know how to live now. I want the fullness of Jesus now. I want the glory that Jesus said he gave to me. I want the spiritual blessing, not the material, but the spiritual blessings that are promised me when I have this knowledge. When I claim it, when I move into it. Where it's not just a phrase anymore. It's a reality. Why did Jesus, he, he, he says in Ephesians 2, 6, he said, and he's made us to sit with Christ in heavenly places, and he's made us to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Verse 7 gives us the reason this revelation was given. He, he said that we might, that he might show Every coming generation, his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. His kindness. Folks, this is not complicated. If you want to, if you want to get down to a simple way of understanding your position in Jesus Christ, talk about his kindness. Think about his desire to have us near him. And the price God was willing to pay and the Christ would pay 
Not just to save us, but to be near us. To be with us. To be one with him. Read John 17. It's all about coming into the oneness and the union with Christ. And that's what it's all about. He, he didn't come to condemn. He said he came to bring you not just redemption, but fullness of life now. You see, you don't have to go up to heaven. Heaven comes down to me. He comes down to you. Folks, heaven is here in my soul, a foretaste of that glory that awaits us. We're giving a portion of that inheritance now. We are not to live as beggars. We're not to live as spiritual paupers. We're not to live in agony and misery. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there'll be times of sorrow. But he said, always abounding with thanksgiving because of his kindness. His everlasting kindness to us. This was all about the kindness of God's heart. In fact, the, the Greek means warm heartedness. His warm heartedness toward his people. And his desire to bring back that which is lost in the garden and that, that unimpeded communion, that un unimpeded oneness where God's heart can thrill, God's heart can be pleased and blessed because we draw nigh unto him that he may draw nigh unto us. Folks, Jesus tore down all the walls of separation. There are no walls of separation to those who want to enter in by faith to the fullness of the revelation of the mystery of God, Christ in us by faith. I want to go a step further. There's another blessing, the blessing of access, but there's another blessing. That's the blessing of acceptance. The blessing of acceptance. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. Now, now that word accepted in the English language, uh, interpreted in English, could, could uh, suggest uh, that which can be endured. In other words, uh, yeah, I can accept him. Uh, it doesn't mean he's favorable toward me. He said, I'll just accept him. Or I can accept that. I can accept that rule. I can accept that regulation. I can deal with it. I can live with it. No, that's not what the Greek means. The word here in Greek is highly favored. Highly favored. We are accepted. In other words, we are very special. We are highly favored by God. And he has... Folks, if you don't know, you're accepted. You can know you have access. You can know that you have. You can go to Jesus any time with any problem, ask any question. But if you don't believe that at the cross Jesus did away with our old nature, if you don't believe that you're accepted in the eyes of God, you're always going to have your eyes focused on your sin and not the cross. The victory there. You're going to be focusing on your weaknesses. I am accepted until I believe I'm accepted. Not just forgiven, but accepted by God. Let me expand on that, if you will, please. Let's go, let's talk about the prodigal son. Don't turn it, but the Luke 15 chapter. Very familiar story. A son of a loving father takes his inheritance and he leaves and he goes up and lives in sin and becomes morally, spiritually, physically bankrupt. And he said, I'll arise and go to my father's house. He's on his way home. Now, folks, this young man had been in the house with the father. He'd been loved. He'd been embraced and kissed. Here's, he, here's a man who knew the fullness. The, Jesus gave us this story to illustrate what it means to be seated with Christ in the heavenly place. A very clear parable or story illustrating this very truth that I'm trying to convey to you this afternoon. And so he represents the backslider. He represents the believer who, who has failed God. Has failed him miserably. And there's, there's a godly sorrow because he said, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against the Father. I've sinned against the Lord. You see, he represents somebody who's walking in repentance. And now he's taking advantage of his access. Because I'm sure when he left, a loving father would have told him. I would, and I believe this of his loving father, especially if in typology. Father would have said, son, my door is always open. 
You have access. You come back at any time. My heart goes with you. I don't want you to go, but I want you to know my heart is open to you. The door is open. And so here he is. Picture him, please. He's going back. He's repented in his heart. He can talk to you about repentance. He can talk to you about godly sorrow. And he comes, and he's heading toward the Father. Means he's taken access. He has that. Folks, this is, this is a very tragic place to be because he doesn't know if he's accepted. He thinks, my father is mad at me. My father is going to be angry. There's going to be wrath. There's going to be judgment on me. He doesn't know if he's accepted. He knows he, 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 the father's a loving father, but I have sinned so much. If you only knew what I've done. He can talk to you about access, and I'm sure that on his way home, the closer he got to home, there were there were people who knew the father and said, "Aren't you so and so son?" Yes, he said. Well, he grieves over you. He calls you his lost sheep, and he goes out looking for you time after time. So he doesn't know whether his father will accept him or not. The Bible says, he said, I'll get up and go to the Father. That's a terrifying place to be, to to be sorry for your sins, to have repented, and to be praying, hoping and praying God will truly forgive you, hoping and praying that, that the Father will receive you and he'll wipe out your past and not ever remember your sins against you again. It's a terrible place to be on the way, the right way, and not have peace, and not have any joy, because I don't know whether or not I'm accepted. Doesn't know his position now. Doesn't know his place. If I had what I deserved, he said, I would be in the pig pen yet. But I'm going back. He's sorry for his sins, godly sorrow. And what a terrifying place. And that's where a majority of believers are in, living right now in this terrifying place. Because when they fail, they say, I'm not worthy. He can't accept me. The father sees him coming. The Bible said he had compassion on him, ran to him and fell on his neck and kissed him. Oh, what a, that's a beautiful scene. He said, well, isn't that wonderful? That is where the story ends. You say the blessing is access and acceptance. Now, he's accepted. He knows it. He's got the kiss. But there's more. And this is the tragedy. We've gone that far and we've stopped in our knowledge of Christ. We've known the kiss. We've known forgiveness. We've known his mercy. But we're not in the house. We're not at the festival. It was the father who said, it's not your worthiness. And the father didn't ask him to dust off his clothes or wash them. Those are our filthy rags of self-righteousness. God doesn't clean you up. He gives you a new life. He gives you a new body in the spirit. He said, get him a new robe. Put new shoes on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. And go kill the fattest calf you can find. And get the musicians. We're going to have a party. I'm not worthy. He said, I'm the one who makes you worthy. It's not what you see about yourself. It's what I see about you. You're my son. You're my son. I'm not looking at your past. I'm looking at your heart. And the robe on you is mine. And you keep in mind, friends, it was the father who said, let us make merry. And the Bible mentions music and dancing. You see, it's not enough to be accepted. You have to enter into the joy of that acceptance, the knowledge of that acceptance. And when you know that and when you follow the father into the house, And the music starts. You tell me that you're accepted by Jesus, then where's the joy? Where's the victory? Where's the rejoicing? 
Oh, and here comes this older brother, looks in the window, and the father's dancing with his son. And there's music, and there's joy, and there's laughter, and there's great singing. And you see, he's in the house. This man, he's been fully accepted, but he doesn't enjoy it. Never once enjoyed, never once set it in to the joy that he saw in that house. Oh, I don't want that kind of Christianity. I don't want the kind of religion where people go around and never experience the rest of acceptance. There's a rest that comes with it when everything of flesh dies and of self. Say, I don't have to prove anything to my God. I trust His Word, and I trust the work of the Holy Spirit in me. He will sanctify me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I can't sanctify myself. I've repented, and I want to be in the house. The robe I have on me is not my own robe. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and I'm received by my Father because I have His robe on me. Oh, hallelujah. Do you want the joy? Do you understand we're the joy of Jesus? I said, you understand we're the joy of Jesus? Rob him of that joy that he wants in you. You take from him the one thing that he desires most. You rob him of the joy he gets in seeing your heart set free and my heart set free till we're at total rest. And every lie of the devil. Folks, you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to wake up every morning and appropriate our acceptance. We're, we're, we're to enter in by faith. Every morning you get up and say, devil, I don't have to listen to your lies. I'm accepted. I'm accepted in Christ the beloved. I don't have to listen to your arguments. I don't have to live in depression. I am in the throne room, seated with Christ. I have access to my Heavenly Father. I'm accepted by my Heavenly Father. And I intend to live in the victory with a life of abounding rejoicing and thanksgiving. It doesn't mean the end of all trials and tests and sorrows. No. But he said it's sorrowful yet rejoicing. It's sorrowful yet rejoicing. Yeah, there's physical pain. There's, 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 but you see, he takes you to his heart. And he says, I'm well pleased. Oh, folks, you, you've got to hear that in your heart. I am the joy of Jesus. He delights in me. He delights because I've come. I want that knowledge and I want that understanding. Will you stand? But look this way for just a moment. Am I getting over your head? Are you comprehending me? How many are beginning to understand what we're saying here? Raise your hand. Right now, can you believe that you're accepted today, that you are truly accepted by the Father? If Jesus were to come right now, do you have the absolute assurance that Jesus is going to have a twinkle in his eye and say, welcome? Because you see, by faith, you're already there. You're in his presence. Hallelujah. You're getting to know him. You're getting to rest in him. So, folks, we shouldn't be a struggling people. Always striving, always struggling to find that joy and that rest. You know, if you just believe what you're hearing, if you believe what he said, my glory is access and acceptance. You have peace like a river. You can withstand. You have that shield against every lion dart of the enemy. Father, bring us as a church into a greater revelation, Lord. I'm just beginning to see what you have in mind for your people, and you have in mind for me and all who, who set their hearts saying, I want more. Oh, Holy Spirit, create a hunger in our hearts for more of Jesus more of true wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. Lord Jesus, you're to become everything in our lives. You're not just to be someone. You're supposed to be all things to us. And Lord, I commit myself to that walk.
commit myself to the place where Christ becomes all in all, where we become one with him, and dissolve our doubts and our fears. Help us to launch out by faith and believe for the impossible. To believe that what I hear in the Spirit, by the Word, is for me. God, do it, I pray. For those that are in this room listening to me now, Lord, and they're downcast. They've been living without the joy, without the absolute peace of God. And Lord, there's frustration. There's anguish and there's fear. Perhaps some guilt or condemnation. Lord, you want to set them free today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Folks, I'm going to give an invitation. And it's going to be only for those, no one shows it very closely, for those who have such a hunger in your heart and you say, Pastor David, I'm not really, I, I don't think I've been getting it. I don't, there's something must be wrong because I, I don't have that rest you're talking about. And I want, I want my life to be absolutely given to Christ. If you've backslidden or you've, you've just drawn away from the Lord or you've grown cold or lukewarm in your heart, I want you to come and let his kindness bring you back into the house where there's fullness of joy, there's peace and there's rest, and there's a song. Lord, do it now. Find everyone in this building, everyone in the annex. And those that are in the annex, I invite you to come also. While they're singing, you say, Pastor Dave, I, I have not entered in to the rest and the joy of Christ. Get out of your seat and come. We'll pray with you. We'll believe God for a miracle in your heart today. And in the annex, you go to the lobby, and the ushers will show you how to get into this building. You can walk down here, and we'll pray with you here at the front of the church. Just step out of your seat. If the Holy Spirit's drawing you, say, Brother Dave, I know there's more. I know there's so much more, and I want that, but, but I, I've been hindered. There's been a wall, and I want that wall to come down. Step right out of your seat. The word I received from the Holy Spirit for you right now, as I've been meditating here, is that you're not to fear. You're not to be afraid. Don't be afraid if you, you don't fully understand what I'm saying here right now. That, that will come. If there's a hunger in your heart, if all you can remember, if I'm seated in Christ Jesus, that, that means that I'm drawing near to him because he's drawing near to me. And you're being brought together by the Holy Spirit. You're being brought closer to Jesus. That's what it is. It has to do with closeness, union with Christ. Being not having to lean on your own understanding. Not leaning on your own understanding. You don't have to understand your problems and how to get out of them. The Bible says just trust me. Trust me. Because I have nothing but kindness toward you. I have nothing but warm heartedness toward you. I'm not mad at you. I'm here now to bring you into the light. And you, you begin to see every, every day that you draw closer to Jesus in your thought life and in your prayer life, and in your Bible study, and in by steps of faith, I am going to receive what God said in his word. Draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. You can do that on the job. You can do that anywhere. Just keep drawing. Let your heart go out. Jesus, I'm reaching to you. Nothing in the world satisfy. I'm going to set my eyes on heavenly things and not on the things of this world. If you've got your eyes on the world, you can't understand this. If the world's captured your heart, we're talking about those who have left that behind and they have repented, given all to Jesus and said, I'm going home. I want to be with my father in his house. I want to know peace. I want rest. I want joy in my life. I'm tired of living like this. Will you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, I am tired of not having rest. Lord Jesus, I know you forgive me. I give you my confidence. And I want to trust you. Do what is right by my willpower, Father, and by Christ his Son. Raise your hands and just love Jesus right now. Just love him right now. I love you, Jesus, with all my heart. I give you everything. I surrender, and I trust you now, Lord. Bring me in. Bring me in. Give me the robe of righteousness by faith. God, put the ring of your love on my hand, on my finger, and let me come with you. That's what you've said. You're the bridegroom. You says, come, follow me.
come with me now. Come with me. Lord, we want to follow you into the fullness there is in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Say a thank you to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.